G'day folks, welcome to the channel. In this video, we're going to talk about whether or not Jesus went to hell or to Hades in between his death and resurrection. So let's get right into it. The first verse we're going to look at is in Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 25 to 28. And this is when the uh, Apostle Peter is speaking on the day of Pentecost to the crowd that is gathered uh, to hear him. And he's uh, quoting from Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11, and he's applying this to Jesus Christ. It says this, for David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. And then you go down to verse 31 and 32, it says, He, referring to David, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Now this is a fascinating passage of scripture, because here Peter quotes from the book of Psalms, and applies this to Jesus. He applies these words to Jesus. And so basically it's Jesus saying here, for you will not leave my soul in Hades. That seems to suggest that Jesus went to Hades in between his death and resurrection. Now the King James literally has the word hell. You will not leave my soul in hell. So if you're a King James only person, you would have to, to say that Jesus went to hell. Now I think it's worth noting that I don't think the scriptures are saying that Jesus went and was tormented in the flames of hell or that he was, you know, um, tormented by demons in hell or anything like that. When you look at the uh, Gospel of Luke and bearing in mind that Acts was written by Luke as well. But when you look at the uh, Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, you'll see there that there's this story of the rich man and Lazarus and uh, the, the rich man and Lazarus died and the rich man in Hades looked up and saw Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. And he was able to communicate with both uh, Lazarus. Sorry, he, he wasn't able to communicate. He didn't communicate with Lazarus. He, he saw Lazarus and he was able to communicate with Abraham. He may have been able to communicate with Lazarus as well, but it doesn't tell us that. But the point is, is that there seem to be two places in the underworld, a place of comfort, referred to as Abraham's bosom, and a place of torment, the place where the rich man was in the flames, being tormented in the flames. And so I think, and I think many other scholars believe this as well, that Jesus went to that place of bliss. And when he was there, he was able to bring out of there all of the Old Testament saints that were there waiting for the coming of the Messiah. You see that in Ephesians chapter 4. Let me show you Ephesians chapter 4. You see... Uh, this victory that uh, Jesus has here uh, when he went down to the lower parts of the earth. It says in chapter 4, verse 8, it says this, Therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. So it seems as though Jesus went down into Hades, into the underworld, and led captivity captive as he ascended up. Now, some people try to say when they look at this passage in Acts chapter 2, they try to say, well, the, the word Hades here just means the grave. Uh, that's not actually true. There are two other words used throughout the New Testament to refer to grave or tombs or sepulchres. But this word Hades is used instead. And, and the word Hades carries with it the connotation of some sort of underworld. And so it seems to me that Jesus went to the underworld. Some people will also try to argue that the word soul, it just refers to the entire man. Now, that's not true either. It can at times refer to the uh, entire man, but at other times it can also refer to the soul, the immaterial part of the person. Uh, for example, Jesus says very clearly in, in both Matthew and Luke, uh, do not fear him who can destroy the body, but cannot destroy the soul, but fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. So we can see there's a distinction there being made between the body and the soul. And I think also there's a distinction here being made. His body was in the tomb and his soul was in Hades. And then afterwards he came up. 
Another passage um, worth looking at is 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter um, 3, verse 18, it says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Now, there are a number of different ways that people interpret this passage of Scripture. Some people say that all this is saying is that Jesus, back in Noah's day, preached by the Spirit through Noah to those who were disobedient in Noah's time. Uh, I personally don't accept this interpretation. I'm not saying it's impossible. It's possible that could be the right interpretation. But I personally don't accept that because it seems to say here, when I just read it plainly, that Jesus, by the Spirit, preached to the spirits in prison. So it seems to be saying, in a straightforward reading of the passage, that Jesus is actually preaching to spirits in prison. Now that leads to two other interpretations. Um, some people say that the spirits in prison are the Old Testament saints that were waiting for the Messiah to release them from uh, what we know as Abraham's bosom, the place of bliss inside of um, Hades or Sheol. Um, uh, people that interpreted that way were many of the early church fathers interpreted that way. Uh, Irenaeus and um, others, um, Tertullian, interpreted the passage in that way. Another interpretation is that the spirits here are the spirits that were um, uh, basically the sons of God, uh, the angels that left their heavenly abode and went and uh, uh, procreated with the daughters of men and produced giants. And so the spirits here, some people say, are the disobedient angels, the rebellious angels um, that um, you know spread chaos on the earth. And this is really interesting because you know, in, in um, Western kind of Protestant thinking, we tend to attribute all of the evil in this world to the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis uh, chapter 3. But ancient Jews also included the influence of the angels upon the sons of men when these wicked angels came down and slept with the daughters of men and produced giants. Traditional Jews, ancient Jews, they attribute the wickedness of mankind to that time period as well. And mankind was almost completely corrupted and only Noah was left as righteous, Noah and his family. And so mankind was almost completely corrupted and um, therefore they, they wreaked havoc upon the earth. That's one particular way of looking at things. And so those spirits, those evil angels, and it also tells us this in Jude and elsewhere, are kept in, in chains of everlasting darkness waiting for the day of judgment. And so some people interpret this and say that Jesus went down to Shia or to Hades and preached in the sense of proclaiming his victory to these wicked, sinful spirits that were being held captive. It's also worth noting that in the book of Enoch, which obviously is not scripture, uh, but you know, we can you know, kind of learn from it, um, learn you know, genre and understand things. Remember the book of Jude quotes from the book of Enoch as well. But in the book of Enoch, Enoch is said to go and to proclaim to the uh, spirits that were um, you know, the, those fallen angels from Genesis 6 uh, that procreated with the daughters of men, he went and, and proclaimed to them their eternal damnation. And so it could be saying here that this is what Jesus is doing. And I think that that's the correct interpretation. That would be my interpretation of this particular passage, that Jesus, through the Spirit, is in Hades proclaiming the eternal damnation of these wicked fallen angels. That to me seems to be the correct interpretation. Another verse worth looking at is Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 17, and um, this is John when he has a vision of Jesus. It says this, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Now, this verse seems to connect the death and resurrection of Jesus with the fact that Jesus had obtained the keys to Hades and death. And it seems to me that Jesus, when he died, 
went down to Hades, went down to Sheol, proclaimed his victory over the evil spirits that tried to corrupt mankind. And he took the keys of death and hell and he released all of the Old Testament saints that were waiting uh, for the coming of the Messiah. He released them to go to heaven. And then, of course, he resurrected himself from the dead with the keys of death and hell. And so we too, when we die, we'll go straight to be with Jesus in heaven. That seems to be, when I put these verses together, that seems to be what the scripture seems to imply. Um, another verse that's worth looking at is in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. And it says this, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, some people say, well, this is just saying that Jesus was going to be buried you know, in a tomb for three days and three nights. A lot of the commentaries that I've read focus on you know, the meaning of three days and three nights. They don't really focus on uh, whether or not this is just the grave or something more than that. But I would say, you know, the heart of the earth, that sounds a little bit deeper than just a grave. And it seems to me that this is kind of a symbolic way of referring to the underworld and referring to Hades. So I see this verse as another confirmation of the teaching that Jesus, when he died, went down into Sheol and released the captives there, the Old Testament righteous saints, and he proclaimed his victory over the evil spirits and then um, took the, the keys of death and hell and resurrected himself from the dead. That seems to be, to be the, the logical explanation for these verses. Now, I understand that there's other interpretations. We can't be completely dogmatic about this. But I just want to quickly respond to one objection that I've heard. Um, when Jesus was on the cross in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 23, the thief asked Jesus to remember him when he entered into his kingdom. And Jesus said to the thief, Truly I say to you, unto you today, you will be with me in paradise. And so he was telling him that he would be with him in paradise that very day. And there are other verses in the Bible that seem to suggest in the New Testament that paradise is in heaven. And many scholars have reconciled this by saying that, yes, paradise is in heaven now. But before the resurrection of Christ, that place of bliss in Sheol, that place was called paradise. We can't be completely dogmatic about the use of the word paradise because in the Old Testament Septuagint, the word paradise is used to refer to the Garden of Eden as well. And so we can't really be strict on the meaning of the word. But I think basically what it's saying is that that thief would be with Jesus in comfort and peace that very day when he died. And so that's how I would kind of reconcile that particular verse. So yes, there are other interpretations. I think the strongest one for me is that one in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, which is why I started with that particular verse. That verse is the strongest one to me because, you know, Luke could have used a different word to Hades. He could have used, you know, at least two other words in the New Testament, uh, a Greek New Testament that are used for grave or tomb or something like that. And so it seems logical to me that Luke deliberately used the word Hades instead of the term for grave or, uh, or, or just even for death in general. Now, some people try to respond to that and they say, well, yes, but that's because the Old Testament Septuagint uses the word Hades in that particular psalm, Psalm chapter 16. But for me, that just confirms what I'm trying to say. It just confirms the fact that Sheol in the Old Testament was much more than just the grave, which is why the Old Testament translators, when they translated the Old Testament into Greek in the Septuagint, they used the word Hades because it had the connotation of an underworld. Um, so for me, I see a very strong case in the Bible for the teaching that Jesus, when he died, he went down into Sheol, went down into Hades, proclaimed his victory over the evil spirits, set free the captives, the righteous Old Testament saints, and rose from the dead with the keys of death and hell. Well, I hope you like this video. If you have, please consider subscribing. Give me a thumbs up, hit the bell notification button. I'll see you in the comments section and you'll see me in my next video.